Content warning. This episode includes conversation about suicidal ideations and suicide attempts. Some may find these discussions disturbing or triggering. Please make healthy decisions about whether to consume this content. It's no time for small talk. Welcome to Deep Conversations with Strangers, a podcast about embracing Waterloo Region's increasing diversity by hearing about life experiences across social, economic, cultural, and ideological perspectives. Let's get to know our neighbors on a deeper level so they're no longer strangers to us. My name is Gregory Bish. For this episode, I'm at the home of New Hamburg resident, Alan Strong. Alan spent his career in the mental health sector, working within local agencies to support some of the most vulnerable people in our community. He helped start the groundbreaking Skills for Safer Living program and himself lives with bipolar disorder type two. So welcome Alan to the podcast. Thank you very much for being one of my first guests. I worked with Alan, me on a volunteer capacity for the Canadian Mental Health Association 10 years ago. Alan worked for CMHA at that point and we got to know each other a bit then, but we didn't get to know each other much in depth. Alan as he calls it, volunteered to be a guinea pig for me. So I really, I really appreciate that. I don't know Alan's life story. And so the, the interview style I've picked for this podcast is called the life story Two interview, which was developed by Dan P McAdams at North Northwestern university. So I've taken parts of that. And it's really meant to get to know the, the person really in depth. So I thought it would be a a good way to start. So how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. I have coffee. Yeah. We brought coffee, which is great. Yeah. Life is coffee. Coffee is life. Time to fuel up. I'm, and I'm really pleased to be here and thank you for inviting me to be one of your first guests. I feel, I feel honored. Oh, that, that's great. And I look forward to our conversation today. So just jumping right into it, let's say that your, your life was a novel. And you're looking at your life in the novel, you open up the, the cover and there's the table of contents there. What would you think if you had about five to seven chapters, what would be kind of the, the titles of those chapters? Do you think? Well, I think the first chapter would be what the hell is going on? <laughs> the second chapter. Okay. Now that I've got that figured out now, what? And the third chapter would be, oh. Really? Is that so? <laughs> the fourth chapter would be, you got to be fucking kidding me. The fifth chapter would be, it's starting to kind of make some sense. Mm -hmm. The sixth chapter was, uh oh, Chongo, the, the sands are running out. And chapter seven would be, well, here I am sitting on my porch swearing at the kids. <laughs> so. Okay. That's very good. Uh, so let's, let's unpack that a little bit. So, um, what the hell is going on? Well, I, um, I picked that because, you know, growing up, my mom was in and out of hospital quite a bit when I was younger mm -hmm. and, uh, she often thought she was Jesus and we didn't mind that so much, but the 12 guys kept showing up for dinner were a bit of a problem, you know, and that's a joke I do in my stand up, but really. Yeah. A lot of my growing up was, um, filtered and shaped by the experience I had with my mom's own mental health issues. You know, my mother was, uh, back then called, she was diagnosed with manic depression, mm -hmm. which is now called bipolar mm -hmm. and I'm the eldest of four kids. Mm -hmm. So uh, a well, lot of okay. the formative years. I'm uh, growing up was, you know, learning to manage, um, mom's experience, mm -hmm. which then became our experiences. Cause oftentimes particularly, we didn't know what was going on and we mm -hmm. didn't know where to step because mm -hmm. it felt like we were walking on eggshells, mm -hmm. you know, in the first 10 years of life, well, there were, mm -hmm. we were four kids, uh, and pretty active house and th and, but but things really shifted, uh, when mom, mom started to experience, uh, I guess the term would be psychosis, you know, our, the first experience I had of her illness was 
she kept the four of us home from school for three or four days. My father was on a, a training you know, for a new job. So he was away. Mm -hmm. So she had us huddled in the living room of our house at the time, in front of the fireplace, you know, she's pitching books into the fireplace and wow. burning uh, family photos and stuff. And she's listening to um, music and getting messages from the music. And I, I was 10 or 11 and we're all going, what the hell is going on here? It must've been a lot of pressure on you as the oldest. Absolutely. Yeah. And then when mom wasn't well, it was off, fell on myself and my sister next to me. Yeah. Um, to kind of do things like cook meals. Oh, wow. And stuff like that. So when, um, and, and when you said your, your mom, uh, thought she was Jesus, you're not, you're not kidding. Like no, that's, I'm not the, uh, and that, you know, I make point of that for the joke, mm -hmm. but oftentimes comedy is, um, is, is a very indirect way of telling truth, right? You know, good comedy, uh, a good drama. There's always an element of truth in that. Yeah, I actually saw the, the stand of truth, but <laughs> others wouldn't know that, um, you, uh, did comedy with a troop of other, uh, people yeah. with lived mental yep. health experience. Stand up for mental health. Yeah. The program was developed by Debbie Grenier, uh, a therapist and a comedian and a teacher in Vancouver. And David also has his own experience with depression. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, he said, why not teach people with mental health issues to do stand up comedy? And his premise was that, um, no one would expect anyone with a mental illness to do stand up comedy. So the comedy is, um, a good way to bust myths mm -hmm. and to tackle discrimination. Mm -hmm. And also for me, it was a good uh, venue for me to start kind of sorting out stuff. Mm -hmm. So I do, I do jokes about my mom and people think, oh, that's funny, but it's true though. Yeah. She did think she was Jesus. Yeah. When you were 11, um, and your, your father's away and she's throwing things into the fire, you're the oldest. Describe a little bit more about what was that like for you at that time? Well, it was confusing as hell. Mm -hmm. Were you scared or just? Well, scared and also just really go like, I don't think, I don't, I don't remember feeling like I, uh, we were at risk or anything like that. Right. It wasn't going to harm us. Okay. But it was just like, what the, the fuck is going on here? Mm -hmm. And really not knowing. And then the next piece I thought about how the hell am I going to tell the kids at school about this one? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. because, and that's the way kids think. Right. Yeah. You know, because I knew we'd probably end up going back to school. I was like, okay, how, why were you away? So I just said, you know, my mom was ill, mm -hmm. but it was really trying to figure and also saying, okay, let's, how are we going to get through this? Mm -hmm. And also let's not rock the boat and mm -hmm. just kind of. Keep things steady mm -hmm. and, um, and wait till dad comes home. Yeah. Let's maybe skip ahead to the next chapter. Now what? Well, and that's, that's, you know, high school and school is kind of like, okay, I got a wacko mother. Now what do I do? Okay. That's it's a clinical term, by the way, wacko. <laughs> but it really then becomes, okay, now what? Especially, you know, trying to navigate the teenage years. Yeah. It's like, now what do I do? Mm -hmm. And because. Her hospitalizations didn't stop. Mm -hmm. She was for a good chunk of my adolescence, she was in and out of hospital at least once a year mm -hmm. and she, you know, she had some tremendous struggles. And I want to point out though, that like a lot of folks with mental health, with mental illness or mental health challenges, whatever you want to call it, um, mom wasn't, you know, when she was not well, she was not well. However, when she was well. She was an active volunteer in the community. She did a lot of stuff. She started a retirement planning program. Like she had a lot of skills and competencies mm -hmm. and those things didn't go away just mm -hmm. because she was mentally ill. Oftentimes we automatically assume that once you get uh, a mental illness, your intellectual Useless, yeah. capacity goes to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. Well, that's patently untrue. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the mythologies that we're constantly struggling with. Mm -hmm. So she was a very skilled, competent, very bright, bright woman. Mm -hmm. Challenge is that when she was not well, she was not well. Mm -hmm. And she had, you know, she drank a lot. She smoked a lot. So there was also the cumulative effect mm -hmm. of uh, all of those, vices. all of that. And yeah. also the medications. 
she was on lithium, mm -hmm. you know, lithium, if you don't monitor it carefully can uh, damage your kidneys. Mm -hmm. Haldol, which is a very strong antipsychotic tranquilizer, which has some very pronounced side effects. Mm -hmm. So some of those drugs were very, very strong. Mm -hmm. and had some very profound side effects. Mm -hmm. uh, she had tartar dyskinesia. So she, that's a, a side effect from some of the medications, which can cause involuntary muscle contractions. Oh, in wow. her case, it's, uh, she would have muscle twitches in her face, the rolling of the tongue. Other people I knew could get extreme muscle rigidity, like a stiff back wow. and stiff muscles, and then you take more meds in order to counteract that. And then, so then you end up on a pharmaceutical cocktail. Yeah. You've got five, six bottles lined up. Precisely. Yeah. So, you know, the impact of the medication mm -hmm. also took a profound toll on her. Yeah. You know, when I think of my own uh, history with meds, I put on about close to 70 pounds. Mm -hmm. When I started on meds, I okay. got up to almost 260 pounds. Wow. And these are the things people don't think about. Yeah. Another uh, side effect I experienced was uh, tremors. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of public speaking. Mm -hmm. So people would see my hands shaking and they think, well, you're nervous. I said, well, no, it's because the meds, I couldn't mm -hmm. hold a piece of paper. Yeah. So yeah. these are some of the things that people don't think about. Yeah and uh, automatically assume that the reason why people stop taking meds is because um, misguided. Well, sometimes the impact of the medication can be just as detrimental mm -hmm. as the uh, illness itself, yeah. so to speak. So in now what the chapter, you're a teenager. It's hard enough being a teenager and you have your mother going through all this. And, and I imagine that that would kind of leak out in different ways mm -hmm. with your friends and stuff like that. What? What kind of impact did that have on that part of your life? Well, I did really have friends over mm -hmm. that often. I would spend most of my time away from home. Yeah. Like I was very active in after school activities like mm -hmm. drama and other things. I'd go to other people's houses. Mm -hmm. Very rarely had people over to my place to hang out because quite frankly, didn't know what, what was going on. Yeah. So it sounds like you're, you had a lot of love for your mother. You had a, would you say you had a good relationship with your mother? but you'd never knew which version was going to show up. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are we going to get Jesus or are we going to get Pat? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or something else Yeah. in there. Yeah. But, uh, but that was it. You know, a lot of, you know, my mom really shaped a lot of my values and my principles. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I chose to go into this field of mental health primarily because of her. Yeah. So, but it was kind of that, you know, push pull yeah. type of relationship. So how would you describe the relationship with your mother? Sometimes it was, it was, um, a good relationship. Other times, uh, I was her confidant and I was her sidekick. Mm -hmm. I was her drinking buddy for, for a number of years. So I think in some ways the, the mother son relationship and the lines got blurred mm -hmm. quite a bit. Um, yeah. Uh, she once told me I was her favorite, which really kind of was icky. <laughs> yeah. So I wouldn't say it was a typical mother child relationship. Mm -hmm. I became the, you know, there's the term, the parentified child. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like it was very close in some ways, but very, very stressful for you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, um, when I graduated from college and then I ended up working in Toronto, I was the last kid to technically leave home, so mm -hmm. to speak, because I felt some sense of responsibility. Of course. How old were you at that point? Uh, 1920. Okay. Yeah. I, I stuck around everyone else. Like when my parents separated, my dad moved to Toronto and then to Montreal. Mm -hmm. My brother uh, went with dad to Toronto and then to Montreal. Mm -hmm. Then my younger sister, Jacqueline ended up in Montreal. Mm -hmm. My sister, Mary ended up going to school in Hamilton. So mm -hmm. then I was left holding the bag. That's the way I felt. At the yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then I finally moved to Toronto when I was 24, 25. Yeah. But then still I would get, she would have tenants. I would get phone calls saying your mom's doing this, your mom's doing that. Wow. Yeah. And eventually I just said, yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. I'm not coming home to, yeah. you know, clean up the mess. Yeah. Because I felt I'd been cleaning up the mess for quite some time. Are we getting into O'Reilly there? Well, O'Reilly was, you know, just sort of 
discovering of that. See, one of the things that I was most afraid of growing up is I'd be just like her. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> little did I know it, but I was starting to drink a lot and part, you know, part of it was I was let out of my cage. Mm -hmm. But then shortly after she died, that's when my own, mm. you know, exploration of the dark side yeah. um, happened. So I was like, oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, so this is what this is going to be, is it? <laughs> so I first had my first hospitalization in my thirties. Okay. And so that's kind of the, oh, really? So how old were you when she passed away? That would have been about 33, 34. Okay. And that's when I first ended up in the hospital. Okay. Is it okay if I ask how she passed away? Uh, her body just said, that's it, Pat, we're done. Yeah. So the story, so in the Mennonite church, mm -hmm. we don't have baptism, we have dedication. Mm -hmm. We're all getting together in London mm -hmm. for Jacob's dedication. Mm -hmm. And my mom was really excited about this because, mm -hmm. um, it'd been a long time since we'd all been together. And Jacob's your son. Yeah. So that Sunday morning, mm -hmm. when I got to the church, uh, our pastor at the time pulled me into his office and said, your life has changed. He said, your mom had died, had passed because when dad went to pick dad and the others went to pick her up, oh my God, they found her and it looks like she had been sitting on her bed and just keeled over. Mm. So we figure it was either a stroke or a heart attack. I know when the police officer asked us if we wanted a autopsy, I said, what's the point? Mm -hmm. She's dead. Mm -hmm. So that that's literally what happened. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, walking into the church. And then, um, and then going directly over to her house. Yeah. So it sounds like it was just heartbreaking at that point. Well, actually at the time it wasn't. Okay. Sue thought it was kind of odd because the four of us were standing outside the house while they were, you know, packing her up, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we were joking mm -hmm. and I said, that's the way we survived. We, all the four of us have a very dark sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And so we're out there cracking jokes and she just thought it was a little odd, but I said, that's the way we deal with stuff. Mm -hmm. It was heartbreaking the following day, but mm -hmm. in that moment, that was our coping strategy. Mm -hmm. And we'd make jokes about mom's craziness all the time, mm -hmm. but that's, that's how we got through it. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you were making jokes about it earlier yeah. and I, I was laughing along with you, but then I worked at this CMHA and like, I've had my own struggles with mental health. Yeah. Um, and anytime we talked about our own struggles, we, you make a joke of it. Cause what else? Sometimes that's fighting against it. Right? Well, exactly. I'd rather be laughing and crying. Yeah. And once again, humor is a good release. Yeah. And also humor gives us permission to talk about the stuff that is unpleasant. So then when I start, then when I ended up in hospital myself, I thought, well, get the jokes on me. Mm -hmm. So did, do you think your mother's death kind of triggered that? Yep. Okay. Absolutely. So do, do you uh, mind taking me through that a bit? Well, I think in hindsight, when I think of what happened after mom died, it was kind of, for me, it was kind of like the, the, uh, the cork got popped out of the bottle. Mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff I've been sitting on. And just, it, it got released mm -hmm. Pandora's box. Yeah. And, um, that's the best way I can think of describing it. Would it make sense to say that you had spent your whole life cleaning up a mess and when you didn't have that mess to clean up anymore, you didn't even know how to clean up your own. Well, yeah, no, mess. it's like, Except, yeah, that's yeah. a really good way of putting it. Okay. Because that's that, because a lot of my function reason, what I did was mm -hmm. it was her. And at this point you, you didn't have any, I didn't have any, I didn't have any official diagnosis. Okay. Your career and everything was kind of based around what you grew up with and your mother. Yeah. That was those, like what your life was essentially about mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. Well, another way of thinking about, you know, oh, 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 really, but it's also like uh, starting over. It's kind, mm -hmm. of, kind of like. All right. Well, the primary focus of whatever of life had been is gone now. Now what? Mm -hmm. Or, oh, really? Yeah. How would you describe like what led to the, your first, would you call it a breakdown or? Well, it was, yeah, I just, I, I described it as uh, just shutting down mm -hmm. 
it was weird because I'd spend all night mm -hmm. pacing the house mm -hmm. to the point where I was getting next to no sleep for almost three or four months. Oh my, and this was immediately after she died? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and then I just shut down. Mm -hmm. I can remember, uh, just should I, I'd spend days in bed, mm -hmm. you know, up all night, but, um, yeah, I just eventually shut down. Mm -hmm. Up all night, would you ruminate? Like, um, yeah. It and got to the point I thought people were in the house. Oh, wow. And oh, just could, from being sleep deprived or from the constant both, ruination? Both. Okay. And then I also started thinking of, you know, harming myself. My mm -hmm. uh, Sue got to the point where she would start to wonder when she got home from work, whether or not she'd find me alive or not. Mm. And then my uh, desire to harm myself became very big. Mm -hmm. And then I start having these thoughts that I had been sent to save the world, but I mm -hmm. needed to cleanse myself first. Mm -hmm. And the only way I knew how to cleanse, could do cleanse wood, would by cutting and lift it. It was pretty mm -hmm. toxins out of my, mm -hmm. just some pretty fucked up shit. Mm -hmm. But what were you cleansing yourself from? The toxins. Okay. Whatever that was. Yeah. So, and that's what ended up getting me into ending up in the hospital because I started looking at knives and going, mm -hmm. so did you actually cut yourself or Okay. Um, did, did you want to talk about that or is that something that you prefer to? Well, it's, it is what it is mm -hmm. in my mind. I needed to cleanse. So mm -hmm. was, and yeah. there was no other meaning attached to that. Mm -hmm. So like you weren't trying to die at that point. Mm, not really. Okay. But the thoughts were there. Okay. So it was, it sounds like it was a little bit of a mix between, you know, I need to cleanse myself, but if I die in the process, it's not the worst thing in the world. Yeah. So I know I'm getting into a territory where people might, might find that shocking. I don't, uh, I, th I think I told you going into this, that because uh, I knew suicide might come up that I've had suicidal ideations all, a lot through my life. Well, and I've, att uh, I've had subsequent attempts yeah. since then. So. Yeah. How would you describe to people who, who might not know what it's like to have ideations or, or want to commit suicide? What pushes someone to that? Like, how would you describe that? Well, I think from, I look at it from a variety of perspectives. One, mm -hmm. my personal experience, one as a clinician as well, because right. a lot of my career, um, was in suicide prevention and yes. intervention, and then also reading a lot of literature and research. Mm -hmm. And really for me, what it boils down to is the one reason people want to die by suicide is they want their pain to end. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. You know, people often look at, well, the reason, the reason that they chose to die by suicide because they lost their job mm -hmm. or this happened or that happened, we, those, those are things that happen, but it's what those things mean to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People want their pain to end. They get yeah. to, the, they get to the point where they feel that they're a burden, that, um, it, the world would be better off without them. Mm -hmm. They're hopeless. They don't know what to do. They feel helpless and they think this is the only option. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's counterintuitive because the general thinking that a lot of people have is suicide is a selfish, uh, selfish. Mm -hmm. I said, well, it's the least selfish thing people do because mm -hmm. the thinking is I'm a burden. The world would be better off without me. I'm mm -hmm. doing people a favor. Yeah. But it boils down to, I want this pain to end. Mm -hmm. I can't take it anymore. So we've dealt with, you know, your, uh, teenagehood and your early adulthood. Um, you gotta be kidding me. Have we, have we gone through chapter four? No. Okay. Well, and the, you gotta be kidding me was kind of the reaction to, oh, really? It's yeah. Like, are you fucking kidding me? So because, uh, because, you know, as I said earlier, I, you know, I never wanted to have, be like mom. And then at mm -hmm. one point in my life, it's like, well, fuck here I am, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I'm not as back crap crazy. I don't think I'm Jesus, mm -hmm. um, but being a Leaf fan, I, <laughs> Sorry, like, that is funny, uh, <laughs> but, but it, it really is. That's kind of 1967 will happen again. <laughs> I just hope it happens before I die. That's all, that's all I want. 
That's <laughs> all I want. Hear me, world. That's all I want. <laughs> but um, the um, it was really this reaction. It's like, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Are you really kidding me? Yeah. The very thing I never thought or wanted to happen has happened. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, and then, um, along with that was a lot of self beating up. And then mm -hmm. I thought, oh shit, you know, I was taking a lot of medications. I was mm -hmm. obese. I was overweight. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, for God's sakes, mm -hmm. the very thing I thought would, I didn't want to happen, happen, you know? And I always thought it's somewhat paradoxical. So imagine I'm get, taking these meds because I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to help me feel better about myself. Mm -hmm. And then in taking the meds, I put on 70 pounds. Yeah. And this is supposed to help me feel better about myself. Are yeah. you kidding me? Yeah. Um, Pat Deegan, who is a well-known writer and author and researcher in the mm -hmm. field of mental health, uh, really captures the conundrum quite well when she says, you know, I take your pills, I go to your programs and I still end up in hospital five, six, seven times. And we keep telling people that by doing this, you're going to get better. Well, and the evidence is, well, some people do, but, and some people don't. Yeah. No matter how many times you end up in hospital, I've had yeah. four, four or five hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. I took the medication. I still feel like shit. Mm -hmm. So then you're left as Deegan describes it, you're left in a situation of saying, well, now what do I do now? Mm -hmm. Because I do what you tell me and it's not working. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's up to me to figure out what will work for me. And that's the paradox. That's yeah. the conundrum. Yeah. You get to that point where it's like, well, the traditional way ain't working mm -hmm. that well. So maybe I need to figure out what I need to do yeah. and what's within my control. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to chapter five. Um, and I believe you said this makes sense. Well, chapter five kind of, I think if I was to think of the eras, you know, I'm moving into my fifties and stuff, things are starting to make, I'm starting to feel comfortable in my own skin. Mm -hmm. I can remember feeling that in my fifties and even more so now that I'm over 60, mm -hmm. it's just like, yeah, this is who I am, mm -hmm. you know? And do I want to change anything? Yeah, not really. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it is what it is. See this package folks, this is it. All <laughs> its gorgeousness. But it really is getting yeah. comfortable in my own skin. Yeah. And recognizing, yeah, I, and I'm okay with that. I don't feel I have anything to prove to anybody. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. That's a big one. You know, it's like, here I am. I wanted to talk a second about Sue, who I, I've just met and she's lovely. The uh, nasty little woman that is my <laughs> wife, she who must be obeyed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's be clear that she's absolutely lovely and <laughs> likely puts up with a lot. And I say that lovely. Well, a lot of people who meet me <laughs> have said, I want to meet your wife. I want to know the woman that's put up with you this long. <laughs> and they, they're quite serious. Yeah. Um, well, um, I, and I think people will get that from this is that, uh, you're a lovely person to be around, but you, you come with a lot of energy. Well, and Sue's my perfect foil mm -hmm. is quite seriously. She's, she's, she's the rock that helps keep me grounded mm -hmm. and <laughs> she's the person in my life who will look at me and go, really, <laughs> really, I have no desire to change her mm -hmm. to something and same thing. Uh, same for her, it, it just that we are very comfortable and we're good friends mm -hmm. and notwithstanding the fact she sings barbershop, I still love her anyway. Is that a hobby of hers? Oh, she loves barbershop music. Yeah. yeah. To me, it's akin to dragging nails across the platform. <laughs> I hate it, but it's, it's giving space. Yeah. So, and she just, she's very common sense and she mm -hmm. just helps keep me grounded. Yeah. Let me tell you a story. Okay. This will describe. Okay. So my last hospitalization was after my last attempt. So I'm in the hospital. I've had the charcoal. I'm in emerge, <laughs> you know, and she looks at me and says, if you ever do this again, mm -hmm. I'll revive you and kill you myself. Sorry, this is not funny. <laughs> it is. But it is. Yeah, we're talking about a very serious thing, but yeah. But <laughs> yeah. It's basically her going, don't ever do this again yeah. because I'll hurt you more than you can ever hurt yourself, <laughs> you bastard. Yeah. 
but, but that, that's it. You know, and when I told it my- It sounds like that's coming from a place of fear on her part. And love. And love. Yeah. When uh -huh. I told, when I told my doc, our doctor about that, he looked at me and says, yeah, that's what marriage will do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she, she very much knows who she's with. Yeah. Uh, and loves you for it. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So how has she adjusted? Cause I imagine when you first got married was before you really knew. Yeah. Um, and so how did she adjust to all of that? Well, her adjustment was basically telling me I'm going to do what I'm going to do anyway. Mm -hmm. And if you want to come say to a family dinner, mm -hmm. you come, if you don't, you don't, I'm going anyway. Mm -hmm. So she was very clear. These are. This is what I'll accept. This is what I won't. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to stop doing what I need to do just mm -hmm. because you're not feeling well. Mm -hmm. I'll support you and I need to do my stuff too. Mm -hmm. So that was very clear to me that, um, she wasn't going to put up with any bullshit. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, you're making sense of life as you're getting past 50. The, the next chapter. So, so what is the title of the chapter? Cause I, I didn't quite get well, it. The sands are running out. Okay. Meaning the hourglass. Yeah. The metaphor for the hourglass is I'm recognizing that I've got more life behind me than I do in front of me. I'm yeah. very much aware of the fact in my family, most of us seem to die in the, our mid eighties. Mm -hmm. So I may have 20, 25 years left of that. I may have 10 or 15 years of good health left. Mm -hmm. And realizing, okay, what do I want to do now? Mm -hmm. Where do I want to spend my time mm -hmm. and what's important to me mm -hmm. and also retiring. So it's really recognizing that, yeah, life is starting to wind down mm -hmm. and I, I'm not being fatalistic or it's just, it's a, it, it, it's a recognition of where you are at, at, yeah. in life. Yeah. Um, we had one more chapter. And I've just got chapter seven swearing. The, the metaphor of me being the old guy sitting on my front porch. Yeah, swearing, yeah. Get off my lawn, you little <laughs> bastards. Or get off my slab of concrete. So have we reached that point yet? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Not yet. I'm still writing the script for that one. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, but you were only wearing at me when I, I drove up this morning, even though I think I took, uh, Sue's parking spot. Sorry about that. But, uh, <laughs> well, your tires may not be. <laughs> But, but it's not so much, I'm not there yet, but I'm aware that that's coming mm -hmm. where it's just kind of like, okay. I feel that, it, that you'll be uh, eccentric, but not in the way that you're swearing at kids. You might make fun of them and joke around with them, but well, I already do that. So. <laughs> okay. So looking back over everything, a, a couple of things we haven't talked about, we haven't talked about your career at all. And I think that's been a important part of your life, but. Let, let me ask it this way. Looking back over your entire life, what would you now consider to be your greatest single challenge that you faced in your life? Good question. I think the biggest challenge is the thing that really drove me through my career is I wanted to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And what motivated me early is that I saw all the crap my mom went through and I said, well, I want things to change. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of that and recognizing that wanting it doesn't guarantee it's going to happen mm -hmm. and understanding that and resolving that tension mm -hmm. because the cards are stacked mm -hmm. against you mm -hmm. um, when you are trying to make significant change. Because I think of, you know, my focus has been on, you know, the mental health system mm -hmm. and validating peer support, and then also the suicide intervention stuff. Mm -hmm. And trying to get things done is fucking nigh impossible. I've gone back and I looked at all the significant mental health reform policy documents since the early 80s. Mm -hmm. Essentially taking a look at when I entered the field in the early 80s and where things are now mm -hmm. and taking a look at all of that. So I've looked at just about every damn thing I can get my hands on. And what I've recognized, there's been a lot of promises. There's been a lot of recommendations. And yet, as the French would say, plus ça change, plus le même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Mm -hmm. You know, I at times wonder, are we any further ahead? Mm -hmm. You know, we keep wanting to pour. And what I keep under, what I keep seeing is we want more money, more money, more money, more money. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point. Uh, I had to ask myself, will we ever spend enough money? 
you know, where's the tipping point mm -hmm. and are we ever going to fundamentally fix the things we want fixed? And to really do that, we have to fundamentally change our entire system. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean our socioeconomic system. And the way we choose to operate socioeconomically mm -hmm. creates a lot of undue, a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. We live in a cult of productivity, mm -hmm. constantly told to be more productive, get up earlier, do more, do mm -hmm. more, do more. So tell people a little bit about what self-help is and what you've, what you did. And then I want to talk about some of the accomplishments that you had okay, with self-help. Well, self-help, self-help Alliance in 1993. The then NDP government uh, funded projects that were called Consumer Survivor Development Initiatives. Mm -hmm. So it was funny. So for, for people who don't know, what's, what's a consumer survivor? A consumer survivor is somebody who like, has the lived experience of, well, it's somebody like us. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we've had our experiences with the mental health system. Mm -hmm. And the Consumer Survivor Initiative was really very much to change the mental health system mm -hmm. because they really wanted to encourage that the people who had most direct experience of the mental health system because they used mm -hmm. the services were to be the architects and to drive change. Mm -hmm. So by funding these initiatives across the province, that was their hope. Mm -hmm. And uh, so self-help originally started out, there was separate organizations. There was mm -hmm. a peer program in Waterloo, Cambridge, and uh, Guelph. Mm -hmm. So these were uh, organizations that were governed and staffed by folks who identified primarily as folks who'd use service. Mm -hmm. so this is a unique concept. Mm -hmm. Skipping through several, a few years of history, self-help was really a merger of those three organizations. So self-help was really meant to be, a, you know, a, a coming together of three self-help or peer support organizations to maximize their resources in order to do things mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm. I was there for 17 years, mm -hmm. almost. And we had some years where we did some really, really, I think, innovative work. Mm -hmm. The two, the two projects that I were most, I was most intimately involved with was one was the recovery education. Mm -hmm. And at that time in the early two thousands, the, uh, movers and shakers in the system thought they should focus on recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, this whole notion of people being the architects of their own mm -hmm. process. So for whatever reason, they went to Ohio. I met with, uh, Wilma Townsend, who was a consultant with the Ohio government. Mm -hmm. And the first thing Ohio said, uh, Wilma said, where's your consumers? Mm -hmm. So it was, <laughs> here's how the system hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. We're going to do this thing. It's going to involve consumers, but we're not going to talk to them about it. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah. Kathy Bazinet, um, was the executive director. She was my manager. We were able to cobble together some money in, um, our point, meaning Kathy and myself saying, if we're going to do recovery education, A, it needs to be driven by folks, consumers, mm -hmm. and it needs to be evaluated by consumers. Mm -hmm. So those were our two big pushes and we had right. some struggles in getting that off the ground, mm -hmm. but we did. So the recovery education, I had the, uh, um, unique opportunity to oversee and guide the development of a training process mm -hmm. that every frontline staff in the system had to go through. Mm -hmm. And it was about, and it really was about taking some time to say, here's the values and principles of recovery. Mm -hmm. How does that impact and influence your work? Mm -hmm. and, and it was great. Mm -hmm. The other project that I was involved with that really I'm quite proud of as well is the work we did around the skills for safer living program. Skills for Safer Living came into being. He had a volunteer at Self Help who died by suicide. Mm -hmm. He had, uh, this individual had made several attempts. And as I said, one day we got the phone call we knew might come, but didn't want to get it. Mm -hmm. And in our own grief response and by that, um, I mean, the uh, staff and the, the members of Self Help, we said, look, we want to do something. Mm -hmm. And Ten and Ash, who is with the Suicide Prevention Council of Waterloo Region, put us in touch with Yvonne Bergman, a clinical social worker at St. Mike's Hospital. Mm -hmm. 
And Yvonne had developed a program called the Psychosocial Intervention for Repeat Suicide Attempters. Because in her role at the hospital, she discovered uh, there was a lot of people who would keep coming back. Of course, yeah. So we talked to Yvonne and we figured, yeah, let's bring skills for safer living to our community. Mm -hmm. So I then became the team lead for the program. Mm -hmm. And essentially it was building and developing and taking Yvonne's program and adapting it and making it come to life. And it really is a harm reduction approach and it mm -hmm. really is helping people to a, be able to find and understand their feelings of suicide, uh, suicidal behavior and understanding that, you know, feeling won't kill you, but the mm -hmm. behavior you choose to deal with that feeling just might. Mm -hmm. So it's helping people identify their feelings, develop strategies to stay safer. Mm -hmm. That's it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. So it's a 20 week group. And so we had to develop, um, our intake process. You know, we took what Yvonne had done in, mm -hmm. uh, Toronto. We made it work. It caught on. I know. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. so tell me a little bit about how it caught on. Well, I think it was word of mouth because mm -hmm. initially. Well, it was successful, obviously. Like, yeah. um, I heard one report that, you know, once this program to uh, like, there hasn't been a suicide among the people involved. Not to my knowledge. Yeah. So. And, and how many, like that's 10 years going and how many groups? I think they're up to 30. Yeah. And maybe 30, 40 groups. 40 groups. And how many people in each group roughly? Anywhere from eight to 12. So that gives you an idea that this is a high, high, high risk population. Well, the average number of attempts when I, I was the team lead with the program for almost eight years, yeah. almost. The average number of attempts people in our group made was seven mm -hmm. and went north from there. Mm -hmm. And wow. I think by that, the, that's, yeah. By the time I left, I think we had had over 200 folks through the program and we did not have anyone die by suicide that we were aware of. Mm -hmm. We had one death of a group participant, but that was by natural causes. Yeah. It's phenomenal. We've had people who have gone on just to flourish and to do really, really well. Mm -hmm. And it, the fact the group is still going, you know, along the way, we were able to implement and develop a group for high school students mm -hmm. and for youth. It, it's, no, no. it's just been phenomenal. Yeah. Because first I can remember a few people looking at us saying, so you want to take a group of people who have all made several attempts at suicide and put them in the same room? Are you crazy? And what was the fear there? Well, the fear was contagion. Mm -hmm. The yeah. fear was, well, you know, the thing that made it unique, though our approach was mm -hmm. unique that everybody who was stopped had their own personal experience with suicide, yep. either as a family member or as an individual. Mm -hmm. And we got feedback from group participants. We did a lot of feedback generation and saying, you know, it was really empowering and hopeful for participants to know that their facilitators had been in the same place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and to, to sort of capture what skills was about, Yvonne quoted to us something one of her participants had said in evaluation and we heard the same thing but this person said to Yvonne you know when I started this group I was living to die mm -hmm. and when I finished the group I'm dying to live mm -hmm. wow yeah it was just... yeah so how does how did that make you feel oh I'm just I'm yeah I'm get the feels yeah as um as I say that because that's what we heard time and time again. Yeah. You know, I remember uh, doing a, a focus group with a, a group of university students. So this one young man said, you know, one time I didn't want to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. Now I'm dying to get out of bed and start my day. Yeah. Wow. And just hearing how impactful the group has been and how people get re-engaged with life mm -hmm. and, uh, and get re-engaged in their full humanity. It's just, it's mind blowing. Yeah. That's something that you can really say. Yeah. Like, well, we did a, a result of your life work. We did a document, we did a, a film, mm -hmm. a short video. And I remember the, the first 10 times showing the video at public meeting, I couldn't get through it. So crying. Why couldn't you get through it? So crying. Well, part of it was just, it was very humbling mm -hmm. 
to know that, um, what we were doing was saving lives mm -hmm. and to hear people say how much the group impacted and changed them was just mm -hmm. humbling. Yeah. It sounds like despite all the policy and all the hurdles that you often have to go through, it was really just that human connection mm -hmm. and being given the resources just to bring those consumer survivors together that well, to, made yeah, to bring them together to do it. It was it just the community. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, oof. yeah. And it's still going. Yeah. That's, well, the, it, that's the part that just blows me away. Yeah. It's still, well, it could, it could very well out, outlive you. I hope so. Mm -hmm. And it was just, and to know that, you know, I was part of, part of a team that pulled that off and did that mm -hmm. was just it, humbling. That's the only way I can, just, it's humbling. Yeah. And, um, and it, it's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this has been a really great conversation. Oh, it's been fabulous. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much for agreeing to do this with me. I really, I've had a lot of fun. Oh, good. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I've enjoyed it. And here's yeah. to more deep conversations. Best of luck with your uh, podcast as it uh, matures, develops, and gets out there into the world. Thanks, Alan. I, well, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Kurt. I will forever be grateful to Alan for being my first interview for Deep Conversations with Strangers. Thanks again, Alan. If you enjoyed this episode, please listen to another. So at what point in your life did things really start to change for you? When my first son got killed. When your first son got killed? Right. That's Kathy Foster. Her personal tragedy triggered a period of homelessness that lasted 18 years, and she spent most of that time on the streets of Waterloo Region. Now she's a resident with Supportive Housing of Waterloo. Listen to my interview with her as part of this first series of Deep Conversations with Strangers. Thanks for listening. Take heart and take care.